Welcome to this collaboration between IEEE Entrepreneurship and IEEE Robotics and Automation Society. We're really excited to have three guests that are all entrepreneurs in the robotics space to talk a little bit about the cutting edge of the science and what it takes to be a founder and a senior leader in robotics in this time and age. Uh, we're excited to have a guest moderator today. Evan Ackerman is the senior writer for IEEE Spectrum's award-winning robotics blog. And he's, of course, going to bring in some of the IEEE Spectrum perspective into this conversation. So without further ado, let's go ahead and I'll see you all at the end with some further resources. Evan? Thanks, Randy. I'm super excited to be um, moderating this panel. It, we have three total robotics experts who are representing a variety of different perspectives on the robotics industry and the robotics entrepreneurship space. And so I will let them introduce themselves, starting with uh, Andrew Kay from Silicon Valley Robotics. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Evan. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of Silicon Valley Robotics, which was started in 2010 by robotics companies to support robotics companies. And we're in the middle of, as Dr. Gil Pratt said, a Cambrian explosion of robotics. So a large part of what I do is working with startups. And in fact, most of the really innovative and influential robotics companies today didn't exist five years ago. So I find that um, it is incredibly exciting and really, really useful to be doing what I can to accelerate startup growth in robotics. Uh, as a side note, I'm also involved in women in robotics. So if that's of interest to you, look out for womeninrobotics.org. So I'm Tom Galuzzo. I'm the founder of a company called I Am Robotics. We're a Pittsburgh-based uh, warehouse and logistics automation company. We develop autonomous robots that, uh, generally speaking, pick and move materials around warehouses uh, using the latest and greatest manipulation, computer vision, artificial intelligence uh, capabilities that are found anywhere. So uh, really a pleasure to be here and talking about all the challenges with entrepreneurship and robotics today. Thanks for having me. Can you just talk about a little bit about what your what you do that's unique in robotics, kind of what what your space is that differentiates you from other folks who are working on maybe similar things? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Evan. So I'm Robotics is uh, really unique in the sense that we're the only company uh, that's really been able to, that has, has commercialized what we call AMMRs or autonomous mobile manipulation robots. So our robots are, um, just a few AMMRs, companies have actually created MMRs. We're, we're the first company that's taking this technology and scaling it to applications in uh, mobile piece picking in warehouses. So our robots are able to drive around a, an environment, a uh, set of aisles and shelves in a warehouse, and they're able to pick products similar to how you would find those products displayed in a retail store shelving setup. So our robots are able to drive around, find the objects on a shelf using computer vision, we have a complete map of the, the facility in the warehouse and where all the items are located. Um, when items are requested from the warehouse management system, a customer has placed an order. The robots are tasked with which items to go collect. Uh, they find them, they, they pick them up using a vacuum uh, suction gripper and either batch pick them or pick them into a particular order profile and then bring them to a downstream process. Usually that's going to a sortation process or some sort of put wall or packing station. Um, we're really the only company that has, has commercialized at scale AMMRs and it's a tremendously challenging technical problem to solve. Um, on top of that, we're also um, bringing some of our differentiated mobility capabilities that we've developed with our Swift piece picking robot. Um, to uh, a new product that we call Bolt, which is basically a generic AMR base that has some really unique features like at four times the amount of power that you would typically find in other AMRs and so forth. So we have a number of things that differentiate, uh, differentiates us, but generally speaking, we have autonomous mobility and manipulation, and we are a full stack robotics company able to do everything from hardware design to software implementation and simulation and modeling of, of full scale deployments. Awesome. Okay, so Thomas, can you tell us what makes you folks unique in your space? 
Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Thomas. I'm the uh, co-founder and CTO of uh, FarmWise, and we build uh, automated robots for farming. So in particular, the um, uh, main first task we focus on is the weeding process, process of removing the weeds from the crops, uh, which is currently done either completely manually or by spraying herbicides all over the field. And, uh, and what we're working on is a machine that can go through a field, identify and classify weeds from crops with uh, machine learning and computer vision, and remove mechanically the weeds. Okay, great. And then, Andrew, of course, uh, you have a, a much different kind of perspective on all of this stuff. So can you talk a little bit about what you do with, with people, what you do with roboticists, and what you do with startups? Thanks. I've had to, we really act as an accelerator. We have to think like an investor. And at the same time, we've also, as a, really a customer reflective organization ourselves, that's very lean and, and agile, we practice the we practice startup lean development and customer development methodologies ourselves internally so i think in some ways i learn a lot from startups and i hope because we have the perspective of looking at hundreds by now hundreds of robotic startups and we have um I, I have a memory of the startups that didn't make it. And this is information that is very difficult to find, which I think is sometimes the most useful information that you can have is knowing that there've been six other companies that have tried to do what you're trying to do and they didn't make it. Yeah, I, I would love to know a little bit more about that, of course. Is there, are there trends that you notice in, in, in the sorts of robotics companies that work and the sorts of robotics companies that don't? Certainly you start to see timings. You know, of course, it's a great myth that your idea is the most important part about your entrepreneurship. Your idea is nothing without execution. And one of the things that we definitely see as trend is that the pace of execution in the Silicon Valley Bay region is twice the pace of execution everywhere else. And it's gotten that way as robotics became investable, because if I track back and look at how long it took robotics uh, companies to get started pre-2010, then it was twice as long as it is now. Now, on average, it's um, three to five years with some startups going from you know, zero to series A in less than two years. And that's really talking about acquisition of customers and preliminary revenue. And of course, in the venture world, you've got to watch what your reading material is because the terminology has changed. What rounds are called what and what they indicate to investors, that's shifted. So, you know, there are more seed rounds than there used to be. Friends and family round sometimes doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the whole accelerator community is, uh, oh, has changed significantly in the last 10 years. You know, this is a moving field. And I think it's very important that you remain aware of that and make sure that your sources of information are up to date. So Tom, you started or I am Robotics started five, six years ago now, something like that, or maybe even a little earlier before I even was aware of it. But can you talk about what made you folks think it was the right time to start kind of this kind of company doing this kind of thing? And at, at what point did you realize that, yeah, you're right. It, it was, it was the right time to start a company like, like I am Robotics. Well, I, I think we started right around the same time uh, a bunch of other warehouse robotics companies got started. I and mean, there was a period there, I think, you know, between, I'll say, 2011 to um, 2015, where there was just a bunch of them starting. And I think there's still companies uh, founding today. Um, the, the thing that made it very apparent was that um, the demand for labor was in the logistics world at an all-time high. Um, the pace at which e-commerce was growing at the time was about 15% per year. 
uh, growing exponentially. Last year, because of COVID, it grew over 35%, maybe 40%. Um, and what I realized was that if you, if you kind of think about all of our shopping moving online, we have about, in the United States, about 40 billion hours a year is spent with people going to a store and shopping for their groceries. If you add up all that labor, that's about the equivalent of 20 million full-time jobs. And so there's only about less than 10 million people unemployed in the country. There just isn't a way to automate and move all of our last mile fulfillment online without substantial automation because they're just the labor and the, the physical work required to deliver all the goods is, is um, insurmountable. We just don't have that amount of labor available. So it has to be robots. And I think then there were some, there were some really key drivers um, that, that sparked this. One of them being the acquisition of Kiva systems by Amazon. In 2012, they were acquired by Amazon for almost a billion dollars. And um, so on the one hand, that signaled that warehouse automation with autonomous robots was going to be extremely important for the future. And Amazon sent that signal to market. On, on the other hand, um, Kiva being taken off the market left a bit of a gap in, in what, what was out there and what was available. So there was a number of avenues to be able to launch a company and, and uh, bring new technologies to market that would be able to solve piece picking challenges and material handling challenges in logistics and warehousing, et cetera. And at what point did you like go from, you know, we have this great idea and we want to turn it to a product and we think there's an opportunity to being like, yeah, okay, this is, this is working. Like we found a niche and, and, and we're getting comfortable. Yeah, I think um, you always there's always some leap of faith when you start a company, and you have to be able to to take that leap. But I think the the primary signal for us was um, we got connected to a company called Rochester Drug, and that was uh, really our first customer. They we said you know hey if we can build you a robot that drives up and down your aisles and picks stuff off the shelf similar to how your people are doing it today. And if we could do it at a certain price point, what do you think? And they said, yeah, that, that would be a no-brainer for us. So uh, we, we kind of laid out the initial business case. We knew fundamentally what the robot would have to do to be able to save enough money and to be able to pick enough products and so forth. And that was the, that was the driver that allowed us to go raise some initial seed funds and, and uh, set up a robot. And, and <laughs> my co-founder, Vladimir, in his basement, we set up our first robot that we bought off of eBay and we started programming some of the vision software to be able to, uh, you know, grab these products off of the shelf. Uh, so the technology was there, it was just at the right uh, threshold, and uh, the need in the market was, was signaled to us by an initial customer. And Thomas, was, was your experience at all similar? And I'm, I'm asking because, like, with FarmWise, I mean, you're you're doing really big robots, you're kind of going out into a space where people may not be familiar with or comfortable with robots. So, so how was it kind of figuring that robots really have a place on farms and, and convincing people that, yeah, this is an idea that, that they should be, you know, subscribing to investing in. Yeah, sure. Definitely. Um, yeah, it's, I would say similar experience than as Tom, like the, um, Initially, like the heart came mostly from discussing with farmers, with growers, and understanding their needs. And on on one side, similar to Tom, like the shortage of labor is really like one of the biggest pain points that's coming from growers. The fact that they don't find enough field workers to do all the farming tasks they have to do. Uh, we also have a second big driver in farming being the, the willingness of relying less and less on uh, chemicals, which can be seen with the trend for organic farming or heavier regulations uh, against chemicals and um yeah and we spend a lot of time going on farms mostly volunteering in farms trying to spend time doing those farming tasks and understanding what growers needed and that's where we realized like these two issues the shortage of labor and willingness to get rid of uh, to rely on uh, less chemicals uh, we're seeing a lot of farming practices and mostly in the weeding process. And yeah, that's where we started to discuss with growers, like, hey, if we were able to have a machine that could automate that process, like, would, would that work for you? And they're all, like, very excited about it. And yeah, in terms of timing, that was 
two previous questions, Evan, that that's also like, uh, yeah, we, we started like five years ago, which was very interesting time as it's time where I would say computer vision starts to be starts to be easier to put computer vision into industrial uh, practices and um, and then uh, and then like make an actual robot that can that can work in farms. And uh, yeah, and so we start build a prototype, put it out there, show it to growers and get their interest. And that's what allows us to raise money and build more and more robots. Andra, a, a question for you. I'm sure that you hear from folks in the robotic space all the time with, you know, they have this great idea for a robot and they think, oh yeah, people are, people are definitely going to buy this. I can make a whole company out of it. But what advice do you have for them? Like on how to take that first step on going from, you know, I have this amazing idea that I came up with in my lab or in my basement to, you know, what, what's the first thing that you do to try and put that on a path towards an actual starting a, a business? Uh, the first thing that I do is try to work out whether they're inventors or entrepreneurs. And I ask them if they want to live with this for the next 10 years. And when I say live with this, I mean 24 seven dream of nothing, but, and if they, there are many people who are great inventors and basically they want to be doing their own R and D lab, creating patents and licensing their technology to other people. And that's not entrepreneurship. That's not creating a company, creating a company. It's not simply about the technology that you're developing. It's about solving the problems for your customers. And it's about creating a company of people and a culture to grow that. Um, and I think those, that's the really first thing that I look at is, are you really an entrepreneur? Because it is a very, very, very hard road unless you are passionately committed. And I'd just like to follow up with a point that Tom and Thomas were making and the question that you first asked about trends. And one of the things that I'm observing now is that the, well, firstly, the most important thing you can have is not investment. Investment is practical and can help you, but there are a lot of robotics companies out there that have had a lot of investment where the jury is still out on whether or not they have a successful robot because they haven't had to rely on just the market to keep them afloat. And I think a lot of those companies will be overvalued or not successful in many ways. The thing that you need is a customer that is ready to crawl over coals to get their hands on what you're doing. And that's the classic statement is you don't want to build a vitamin, something that's good to have. You want to build a painkiller, something that you have to have. And having f first or early customers that have to have what you're doing will firstly head you towards revenue. And revenue gives you a much stronger bargaining position if you're looking for investment. And secondly, we'll make investors go, this is a no brainer. Uh, really, you satisfy their criteria. But I think I wanted to ask Tom and Thomas, are you seeing this transition between what your customers really want from you as the market matures? Because I think in a lot of cases, we're seeing the category creator. And that's the company that needs to have really deep pockets because they're the first ones out of the gate. And then there's the, then there are the category leaders and that's the two to six companies that emerge as the market is ripening, getting ready for this. That as, as we've seen with the development of the autonomous mobile robot space in logistics, and what you do a couple of years after that, if you're heading into that same space, you know, I think you have to have a very different value proposition. You're not a category creator. You're not a category leader. You're now competing on different criteria. And, you know, um, Tom, Thomas, is that something you're aware of yourselves in seeing a progression in the, the market spaces that you're in? 
first of all, the, to your to your point about creating a company versus invention, entrepreneurship versus invention, I, I totally agree with you. And this is, robotics is classically a space where it's really difficult to have a solid entrepreneur and business person be successful at starting a robotics company. Vice versa, it's really difficult to have someone that's a pure technologist and robotics ro roboticist and inventor be a great company leader and business person. So the, the challenges are basically on the business side, you know, it's if you don't understand all the pitfalls of which robotics technologies will work, how long they'll really take to scale, how long they take to invent, that's typically a pitfall for pure business-minded entrepreneurship people is they really don't understand what robots are capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing today. And so they get themselves into situations where they overpromise the customers and the customer expectations too high and they can't deliver because the technology is really not fully there. And then conversely for the robotics inventor, very difficult for them to really understand the, the, the nature of economics for the customer know, the end game of scaling a company, growing a business, and so forth. I was more of an inventor, and it's taking me, probably took me the better part of five years to get um, more comfortable with the business side. Um, in terms of the market trends of where, where things are going, and, and are, I, I didn't fully understand your question about, you know, are, is, is the market progressing into, in, from, from kind of an initial customer or initial technology to something broader, or is that what you're saying? I, I guess it was you entered your first customer's um, facilities with a certain promise. Is that still okay. the most powerful promise that you can, the value that you can offer? Or now that they are, now that they have accepted what you can do, are they now more interested in things like cost reduction or... Um, speed increases. I think you had to succeed on a lot of um, a lot of axes initially, and now we might be looking for differentiation. And I'm just wondering if you if you think that we're into this kind of market differentiation, or if it's still such an early stage, and the access to robotics is still um, so uneven. That's perhaps the other fear that I have is that very few companies are able to find a robotics solution. Yeah, I, I, well, particularly with AMMRs, uh, the it's still a fairly nascent technology. It's still very advanced uh, considering where autonomous robots are today. I don't think we've seen them have a transition to a, a bulk broad application where where um, market leaders are slightly differentiating from each other and customers really have an absolute need and addiction to, to using that kind of technology. But I think we, we are seeing that with AMRs in general, that they are being more broadly accepted and that kind of uh, cost reduction differentiation is, is coming into play and the market is really saying, signaling that, yeah, these are these are technologies that are here to stay and play for a long time and that they are absolutely going to become a dependency for logistics and uh, material handling in the future. Um, so not so much on the AMR front, but I think definitely on the AMR market. Interesting. Yeah, I can sort of it on the uh, farming market as well. Um, yeah, to, to your question, Andrea, I don't think we're there yet, as you say, we're there so many companies that they have to uh, really find like strong differentiations between themselves. I think on the farming side, still like a early, um, early adoption on these robotic products. So growers right now are still just curious what's out there and how well it can work. But, but we definitely, I think, seeing a transition from early robotic applications where now we're, we're selling robots to people that, that, are not interested in the robots themselves, but just in the work they can do. And therefore they don't want to hear or deal with the complexity of robots that can may, make some customers in other domains like very excited. Uh, here, like at least for growers, they just want something that works. They don't care that it has like I don't know, crazy arms or this new GPU that you're just trying to put and you're very proud of. They just want something that works reliably every single day and gonna get the work done. And yeah, and I think there's definitely an interesting transition and phase in, as you described previously, like 
in the company stage itself, going from like a early lab invention to like a final product that really works all the time. And, and even in to get to more and more customers that are potentially less tech savvy, really getting to a robotic application that works as well as any other product, which in outdoor environments, in particular in hard environments, uh, is definitely still early for robotics. And, uh, and yeah, I think robotics, robotics in general as a field has more interesting <laughs> places to, to grow, to be able to easily build very reliable outdoor robots. So Thomas, are you saying that, that at least with some or, or many or most of your customers, they don't really care about the robot anymore. They just want something that solves a problem for them. And then uh, kind of, if you can follow up on that, Tom, is, is that the same or different in the warehouse space where it's no longer about the robot? It's just people want a problem solved. And if a robot can solve it, then that's the way they want it solved. Yeah, yeah, Th thanks for the remark. And then, yeah, I would say that similar difference and internally difference in every industry between the early adopters and more like the, <laughs> the rest of the, the rest of the group when have the early adopters that at the same time, like really excited about, let's say, just say what robotic applications can bring and like how flexible it can be. And they have these crazy visions or like, oh, it, then I'll be able to do that. He'd be able to do that and that and that and get very excited about that. And then as the number of robots grow and get more and more customers, definitely more and more of them are like, right, <laughs> I see your product. I appreciate the, the complexity, but I really just want something that works uh, and that can like bring on my farm, turn on in the morning. I know I'm going to complete my field at the end of the day and move on to the next field. And um, yeah, we, which makes sense. Like these people are, are business people. They have like better farming. It's a very complex industry with a lot of processes and we're solving like one of these process out of many of their farming tasks. So they, they don't have time to get specialists at every product that gets sold. Like this is one of their process. They want something that works and move on to the next process. There's zero interest or appetite for robotics for robotics sake in any industry. Uh, you're, you're really, at the end of the day, the problem you're solving is saving money and delivering a return on investment. And uh, there's multiple things that uh, customers are looking for out of robots to, de to deliver that ROI. There's, in the warehouse space, there's things like flexibility, storage density, uh, um, just general throughput, and, and can they increase their capacity and throughput um, for how many orders they can deliver, et cetera. Um, at the end of the day, it's all about return on investment. It's the, the, the sale is always justified on cost savings and how quickly the robot's going to return. Robots being a particularly risky, especially new robotics companies and new robotics technologies being a particularly risky venture for any warehouse or logistics company to play in, it actually serves as a, 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 a kind of um, tightening of the constraints of the ROI, that the ROI needs to be stronger, the riskier the technology is. So if you look at technologies that are not super risky, conveyor, warehouse management systems, and so forth, all of those things are used to uh, decrease the overall cost of the warehouse and increase the efficiency. Customers and, and the market is willing to, they're willing to adopt maybe five year or longer ROIs on those incumbent technologies. For new technologies, the bar is actually much higher. You have to be able to deliver a return on investment uh, in a year to two years um, before customers will really start to take the risk and consider you. Uh, so we've done a lot, and, and Kiva had to do a lot to, to de-risk the sales and, and offer performance guarantees and money-back guarantees to be able to take that issue off the table. Um, and that, that's, that's of critical concern in, in our customer space. And Andrew, I was hoping to get your perspective on this a little bit. It is, you know, I would I would guess that at some point when people who aren't familiar with a robotics startup hear robotics startup, they get, you know, like, oh my gosh, it's a robot. Like I, I want to have that working for me somehow. But are we starting to see kind of a, a bit of a cultural shift where it's no longer as sci-fi and it's sort of it's becoming 
more of just a normalized part of the way work is done? And if so, how does that change someone who is who has an idea for a robotic startup? Does it change their approach that robotics is is now just kind of a service and not something maybe quite as exciting as it once was? That's a very deep question. And I think it depends a lot on what market you're talking about. Because, for example, in something that's very, very customer service focused, then robot can add excitement and can be a selling point. And uh, it, it's an entertainment kind of value. And that does lead us to a sort of over over specifying of the robot rather than not. I mean, think of some of the coffee robot kiosks, for example not doing anything that the coffee machine isn't doing. In fact, they are coffee machines very quite often that have an arm that hands you the coffee. But it's um, the cost of robotics is dropped to the point where people are coming up with um, investable business plans around using robots as an entertainment. And that's always going to be a percentage of the market, but for the rest, I think it shows in what conferences and trade shows you would go to as an early stage robotics company. And unless your idea of a fun conference is concrete world, then I don't think you should be doing construction robotics because really your world is going to be all about concrete and or rebar or other kind of um, everything to do with construction. It's not going to be about robots and robotic conferences anymore. Uh, with the exception of IEEE more academic conferences, because we've got a really, really fast cycle these days between people developing new technologies, often the algorithmic technologies now, we're not seeing much more um, invention around form and function, obvious, not much obvious invention in form and function, but we're seeing a lot of um, value add in terms of algorithmic um, and sense of fusion in robotic solutions. And we're seeing a very, very rapid iteration between people who are studying robotics and people who are launching companies. And what I've seen, I've been part of the industry track at a few conferences, ICRO, for example, and HRI, and it's becoming a, I'm seeing viable startups pitching in what used to be quite an academic uh, scenario, setup and scenario. And I'm seeing industry participants want to be part of these academic conferences because firstly, recruitment. As robotics grows, one of the biggest problems we face is how do we get enough people to be building these robots? But then the flip side of that is also how do we get robotics to the 95% of industries that aren't the early first adopters? And that's where we're going to see fundamental economic and social shifts. I'm a little concerned if we have a, a kind of monopoly effect. And I think finally bringing it back to what you said about people being excited about robots. What worries me is the people who are scared about robots. And they're usually scared, not because of some Terminator scenario, but they're usually scared because they see a robot as taking their job. And what's most likely to happen is that if their company doesn't automate, it's going to go bankrupt and shut down and everybody there will lose their jobs. So that's that's the outcome that I would like to avoid. When we adopt robotics early, people get a chance to see that they augment their own labor and they increase the productivity, which then increases the hiring that happens. So it's actually a positive all the way around. And I think we're going to see we're going to stop calling them robots for the most part. We, we, we're going to have hands-free tools, which are just the next iteration of our gradual development of um, 
tools to assist human labor. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think, and you know, a lot of robots or things that we should be calling robots have already made that that transition, right? With our dishwashers and our toasters and and all of that kind of thing. And uh, but I'm not going to get into the what what is a robot question here because <laughs> that would take up all the time we have left, and unfortunately, we don't have that much time left. So I I just want to ask everybody kind of one more question. Uh, to wrap things up, which is is, is a really general one. Um, maybe Tom, starting with you, I'd love to know, you know, do you have, what's the best piece of advice you you got kind of when you were starting out? And if you're willing also, what's the worst piece of advice that you got? Um, well, I, I, it's been so long, I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> uh, the best piece of advice I would give anyone now starting a robotics company is, Put put down the technology problem for three months and focus on the economic problem for three months and really dig in to understand objectively what are the economics required for the end user, for the customer to really drive broad adoption and what are the economics required for you as a company to really generate enough profit and, and revenue to scale. And um, the more you can be honest with yourself about those things and, and, and be very conservative with your estimates, uh, and if you still have a business case at the end of the day, even, even in the pessimistic scenarios, you still have a business case to have a, a profitable company that can scale and deliver real savings for customers, then you might have something for starting a robotics company. Um, and the only way you're going to get a true answer on that is probably having the market itself validate it, really show them the numbers and have them say, yeah, this is good, or no, we wouldn't really invest in something that has a six or seven year ROI. <laughs> you, know? uh, you have to have those conversations, honestly. The worst advice? Gosh. Um, uh, yeah, yeah I, I don't think, I, I agree with it. Andra, that you don't want necessarily just to go after, you know, the, the investment first. You really want to go after the, the customers first and, and make sure that you've, you've solved their problem and that you can generate some paying customers for what you have. Um, I, I, think, I think that would be it. Awesome. Thomas, how about you? Yeah, very interesting. I think my yeah, the main advice would go in the in similar line as Tom and very similar to what Andrea was saying uh, just earlier. I think yeah, you you need economics is really what make the dif can make the difference between a, a robotic product that really works uh, and like can make it to a broader audience, or like just a research cheaper type of product that uh, stops at very early adopters. And yeah, I would say a lot of I don't know, it's definitely in that category. A lot of people go with the mindset of. Oh, I can do this crazy technology and that can work out and that's going to solve this problem. But in practice, like, just as Tom was saying, oh, if you have like a seven years ROI on that machine, a lot of people won't be able to get it. Or if you're, if you're trying to make a task more efficient, but it takes actually much longer than uh, the way it is done currently today, like that's not going to work. And yeah, and really spending time understanding like, oh, what's the, my, the minimum product I can create to make it work, like the, the minimum amount of complexity I can do to to have that work. And, and when I get that, how how efficient does it get? How much more efficient does it get compared to what is being done today? I, I know the, the classic rules of thumb, for instance, is they say like, oh, do something that's 10 times better than what exists. Uh, it's, it's often hard, like 10 times is a lot in terms of difference, but that gives like a, a decent order of magnitude because usually we make times two times three mistakes of like what our unit economics actually are. So if we aim for times 10, we still fall back on something that still is very interesting for uh, the end consumers, in our case, for, for growers. Um, so yeah, I would say, yeah, that's definitely one of the uh, biggest challenge for robots to make it to a broad audience. In terms of worst advice, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> I'd have to think more on this one. Um, I'd say one definitely that pull up with like what Andrea was, um, was describing, say it, it's very important to talk with customers, talk with people that are gonna use the product. And I would say like, I think one advice 
we had received was like, oh, as soon as you find like a couple of people that are interested, like go for it. And yeah, I'll, now I have to trust me, I'll be particularly careful about that because the, the first few people you end up talking to are usually your early adopters that are really excited about like the robotic part and they don't really care about like the complexity or things like that because they, they just find it really cool. And actually, as you start talking with more people, you realize like what the broader audience is and like how much simple it needs to get. I imagine like cars may have been through a similar transition where there's only a very complex piece of technology at the beginning that a few passionate people loved. But then to get to everyone, like most people don't know how their cars work and that's certainly for the best. So yeah, I would say definitely talk with people, try to talk with a lot of people so you can really get a broad understanding of what's going to work out there and not just with a few people that are really excited about the robotic aspects. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great piece of, of bad advice. I, I, that's exactly what I was hoping for. Cause I'm sure that you know, when you're starting a robotics company, people are telling you all kinds of things and, and you're not always sure, you know, whether, whether you should believe what they say. So it's a learning process for everyone. And, and Andrew, I'm, I'm sure that you, you hear mm -hmm. more rob robotics advice and give more robotics advice than anyone. So uh, why don't you wrap this up for us? Ah, thank you so much. I loved every word that Tom and Thomas said. You have to walk in your customer's shoes for sure. But before you do that, walk in a robotics entrepreneur's shoes as well. You know, take advantage of every piece of advice, everything that you can learn from others who have created a robotics company. And I learn continually from every robotics startup that I talk to. I've invested, I've got skin in the game, and I've made a lot of mistakes. And when we talk about bad advice, I think it was advice I gave to a startup early on in the piece. And without mentioning names, it was a food robotics startup. And uh, I was still thinking, not like an investor, I was thinking about growing a business. And I will say that's not a bad thing. There are perhaps a lot of robotics entrepreneurs out there that are going to be happier building a business than a venture backed company. And it's about multiples of growth, ultimately. Uh, but I suggested to this food robotics company that they start talking to the major fast food outlets to see if they'd be interested in technology. And what the actual investors said was, shut up, get stealthy. We're going to kill all the fast food companies out there. Don't tell them a thing. And to that stuck with me because it really highlighted how a venture backed company thinks orders of magnitude differently. It's about global domination, really, to what would have been successful business advice. And I still think that it's important to recognize there's a place for being a successful business, that it's not all about being venture backed and global domination. Well, I think that that is a pretty profound <laughs> and wonderful way to kind of tie up some of the conversation um, because I'm going to hearken back to some of the stuff that we talked about. As usual, when we bring together uh, IEEE entrepreneurs and scientists, I have two pages um, of detailed uh, takeaways. I'm going to highlight just three or four of them for our audience. Um, number one, if you're an aspiring entrepreneur listening to this and thinking about either robotics or some other engineering technology, ask yourself, you know, are you an inventor or are you interested in running a business? Because it is about the customers and we circled back about all sorts of variations on, on what is a customer, what is your core customer base? And, and these are important things for all of us to remember as we're founding a company. So if you're in a company, running a company and realize that you're an inventor, not an entrepreneur, <laughs> then the answer is you also need to pull people into your business, right? You need to decide what to do so that you can make that scaled growth. So maybe it's bringing in a co-founder, maybe it's working with a tech transfer office, all of those different things to allow you as an individual to be the best you that you can be in this world of robotics. Um, also, again, solve problems for your customers. We kept coming back to customers. One of the things that we also talked about was how do you get past that death valley of being startup to a scaled company? 
And one of the things that, um, that Andra helped point out to all of us is that you need to respond to your customers because your customers will change as you scale, as you grow, as you go from a small business provider to a big business provider, and you need to change along with them. Uh, you need to look at your value proposition. Is it, does, are you actually still fulfilling both your early stage customers and your current customers? Because that's how you're gonna keep growing or scaling or taking adventure and selling the company and going on to your next great thing. Um, finally, in consumer electronics, bells and whistles are what are going to sell your product. <laughs> bells and whistles are what's going to make, uh, you know, the big toy companies buy a toy robot, whatever it is. But if you're dealing with business co customers, again, you need to create the painkiller. You need to solve their problem. Those are just some of the takeaways. I'm going to go back to all of our wonderful speakers for one moment before we close to give you one last takeaway from them which is over and over again, you all mention things about attending conferences, talking to your peers, talking to your customers. So uh, if each of you, you know, again, Tom, Thomas, Andra, since we've been cycling through that, if you could give us what's the one, um, one place you consistently go to yourself, uh, and it can be an IEEE resource, there are certainly plenty of them that we're gonna share, but if it's another resource, please share with our audience what they should be reading or attending. Tom? So in the material handling world, if you're going to do anything in logistics, uh, there's a few good conferences. I highly recommend the Modex conference and or the Promat con conference. They alternate every other year. They're amazing. Um, hopefully with COVID ramping down, we'll be able to actually get physically back into those conferences next year. Thank you. Thomas, any quick uh, things that come to mind? <laughs> Let's think more of this one. Uh, I, can, I can at least give like the uh, the farming related one. There's like the uh, the World Ag Expo, uh, which when it was happened physically is uh, happening in, in California. Uh, last a couple of days each year, and that usually brings all type of piece of technologies used in farming. And even if there are only a few of them are robotic related, it tends to give like a great idea of what farming equipment looks like and and no or if I have to make a robot in that industry, this is what it should look like. Uh, so very, very cheap conference, a uh, lot of pieces of equipment everywhere, very interesting. Thank you, Thomas. Andre, can you help close us on a recommendation and then I'll list the rest of the recommendation. Well, I personally hope to be doing more startup workshops at IEEE conferences and including inclusivity, hiring for inclusive robotics. But one of my earliest go-to resources, and I think, you know, the fact that Evan is here, he did not pay me for this. We, I, I read IEEE Spectrum all the time, and Evan is always first with the best information about robotics. Well, thank you, Andra, for that. That was a fantastic little uh, uh, cross off on my list. Obviously, also IEEE Robotics and Automation Society does collaborate with Spectrum and um, and you yourself are, are a volunteer with those conferences. So um, I hope that we'll see more of that. Um, in a moment, uh, you'll see all of the resources come on the screen. Um, I ask you to please visit entrepreneurship.ieee.org, um, as well as uh, Robotics and Automation Society and Spectrum regularly. They are great resources and um, thank all of you for being part of this today. It's been a wonderful conversation and I look forward to hearing questions from our audience via email in the future. Thank you. <laughs>